All right, I see we have a lot of new people joining the webinar. Uh, again, uh, thank you guys for joining and welcome everyone to this online webinar on managing SMEs under the new norm and to end business management. Uh, again, before we start, I just want to give a few house rules uh, for those people who are attending the webinar. So first and foremost, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in the Zoom group chat uh, and we will get into discuss that later while our speakers are talking. And if you have a question, please state who the question is for so we know who to address the question to. Or if it's for everyone, please do state every, Please do state the question is for everyone. Uh, as for the people who are attending as well, uh, if you're not talking, please as much as possible mute yourself. But during the question and answer, just ask permission in the chat if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, so you can do so and start asking your question to our speaker. Uh, last and foremost, I mean, the last rule, house rule that we have really is we want all of you guys to learn. We want all of you guys to make the most out of it. So as, just, as much as possible, we want you guys to ask as many questions as you can to our speakers. They're all here to try their best to help give insightful information to everyone. Uh, yeah, I mean, for now, let's wait a few more minutes, then we'll start the webinar. Hi Marina, thank you for joining as well. Hi Vince, thank you join, for joining as well. Uh, if you have other friends who are joining the webinar, please tell them to join as we will be starting in a few more minutes. Oh, we have 50 now. <laughs> Jeff, are you ready? <laughs> I'm going to faint. <laughs> <laughs> like even though I don't see everyone, um, seeing the numbers is like wow. <laughs> I can only pitch. Just imagine to... you're presenting to your your employees. <laughs> <laughs> We're all waiting at our at the edge of our seat, Jeff. Uh, yeah. To hear your presentation. Uh yeah. Dennis, do you want to start? Ah, uh, yeah. We're already here at uh, two eleven, so uh, sounds good. So, uh, right. uh, again, guys, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, today's webinar will be on managing SMEs under the new normal, end-to-end uh, -end business management solution. Uh, I already mentioned the house rules a while ago. Uh, I just also want to state the program flow for today's session, so you know what's going to be happening throughout the webinar. Uh, again, we have three main speakers for today. We have Dennis, we have Judy, and Jeff. We'll be talking on three different topics. The new customer behavior amidst the lockdown, assessing financial visibility during business slowdown, delivering your products and services during and after the ECQ. So after every presentation or after every keynote that your speaker presents, we will be asking or we will be allotting for you to ask your questions. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to put it in the Zoom chat group. Uh, and if you want to talk, please, uh, as much as possible, say it first in the group chat before speaking. And as much as possible, please mute yourself while the speakers are speaking as well. Uh, after the three speakers have presented their presentations, we will be having a panel discussion right after. So for those who weren't able to get their questions answered, or if you have other follow-up questions, please feel free to ask your questions during the panel discussion. All right. Uh, now that we got that uh, out of our way, welcome again to this webinar. Uh, as we all know, our country and our people uh, and SMEs have been affected by this COVID crisis as well as the lockdown. And our, our hopes, our hearts and prayers go out to you and your loved ones, but if we work together, I mean, hopefully we can be able to find new ways, new solutions on how to better manage, manage our situations and find the good with the bad. And, and that's why we're here today. We work together on ways the SMEs of all industries can learn, innovate, and take action 
so that we can all endure and come out of this better faster with a new found of So let's begin first by introducing myself. Again, I am Carlo. Uh, I'm from Kubo Innovation Hub. Uh, Kubo is actually a, the first and first and only public-private uh, organization that's actually supporting tech-enabled startups. We do this through creating mentorship, uh, doing market access programs, uh, workshops, webinars, and the likes, and many more. Uh, and our main goal really is to help tech-enabled startups here in the Philippines develop uh, into becoming more prosperous and better startups that can compete outside the Philippines and expand to other markets. I mean, our vision really is to, is Filipino startup changing the world? And really for this, we would just want to uh, support and sponsor all these sets of endeavors. And if you want to learn more, please visit our website. Uh, you can find it online, it's www.kubo.com.ph. Uh, I also want to first also introduce uh, and thank our other sponsors who, or, who helped us organize this event. Uh, first and foremost is Bounce Back PH, the official Philippine Facebook community that has harnessed the power of social media that encouraged over 28,000 Filipinos to bond together and find solutions and support. Uh, for those, any startup or startup founders or for business owners out there who's joining the webinar and is not part of this Facebook community, I highly do suggest that you guys should join. Uh, as this is a great platform where you can find new opportunities, find new people, ask and seek for advice. So again, if you're not part, please, as much as possible, do, do join this community. Second, we also have Union Bank Global Linkers, the online global network and community that has helped over 270,000 SMEs connect and collaborate. Uh, last, but definitely not the least, we have Monster Hub PH. Not just the premier co-working space in Makati, but the community that supports SMEs through their shared, through their shared service center to help them scale their business. Uh, now that we've thanked our major sponsors who helped us brought this uh, webinar together, I'd want to bring it now to our main event with our main speakers. Uh, our first speaker for today, we have Dennis Velasco, CEO of Prosperna.com. So Dennis is over there. Uh, he's been the one chatting with all of you. Uh, or if you're not familiar with him, uh, he's the one, uh, he's the CEO of Prosperna.com. Dennis is actually a Phil Am who spent 15 years in Silicon Valley, leading and building some of the fastest growing software companies. Prior to turning into his corporate laptop, he was actually the VP of North American sales for Cerro Small Business Accounting. He was the director of SME division of Cornerstone on demand and built the first professional service department for Salesforce.com. Dennis Dreams was to come back to the Philippines to empower 100,000 SMEs with Silicon Valley quality startups that fuel customer acquisition and retention. Dennis will be sharing with us his insights on the new customer behavior amidst the lockdown. Uh, so Dennis, if you have something to say, uh, please welcome our audience for today. Uh, and hopefully this will be a fun and exciting time. Yeah, I yep. just want to say hi awesome. and thanks for everybody joining. And uh, it's really uh, uh, amazing to see everybody come together like this. So thanks. Uh, after Dennis, we will be having Judy Lorenzo. She is the CEO of My Boss Asia. Judy is the marketing professional and experienced entrepreneur and founder of My Boss Asia, a back office shared service company which also operates the Monster Hub in partnership with Monster Lab, a Tokyo-based technology company. Judy will be highlighting for us assessing financial visibility during the lockdown, uh, during the business slowdown. So mm -hmm. Judy, if you want to say anything or welcome our guests also, or audience, please do so. Hi everyone. Hopefully you'll get um, meaningful insights from our discussion today. <laughs> Uh, and of course, last but definitely not the least, we have Jeff, uh, the co-founder of Last Mile Incorporated. So Jeff is the CEO, founder, head of business for Last Mile, a tech-enabled logistic ecosystem platform that aims to solve the, the pains for businesses who are in logistic operation and also the platform that uh, business that relies on logistic services. Jeff's role in Last Mile is to create products and business models that would generally suit the target and end users' needs. And Jeff will be getting us to a deep dive into the topic of delivering your products and services during mass, during and after the ECQ. So Jeff, if you have anything to say as well to our audience, just to, you know, lighten the mood. Hello, 
Hello, Jeff. So, hi everyone. Good to be here. So, yeah, good numbers right now. Um, hopefully, get their clear um, strategies on how you can actually deliver to your customers or your services. So, yeah, talk to you guys later. All right. So, again, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Uh, amidst all the chaos caused by the pandemic, there is still a ray of hope in the world of SMEs because of events like this, with people like you joining us for today's session. Uh, we really hope that all of you will make the most out of it by asking a lot of different questions for our speakers. Uh, before we kick things off, I just want to again remind everyone, if you're not uh, during the speaker's uh, presentation, please, as much as possible, mute yourself. So it will not disrupt the, the flow of the speaker. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box. So let's kick things off first with Dennis Velasco, CEO of Prosperna. Uh, Dennis, if you can start sharing your presentation with us online. All right, cool, cool. Well, uh, thanks, Carlo, and appreciate you um, bringing everybody together in our community. And it's uh, amazing to see such um, participation from the Philippine SME community. It's, uh, you know, extremely motivating and um, it, it's just great to see. So I'm really glad to be here and uh, extremely grateful to have this opportunity to share our insights with the entire community of SMEs here in the Philippines. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of background on Prosperna, um, ever since I moved uh, to the Philippines, it's, it's really been our mission uh, to help empower um, the SMEs uh, in our country, in our region with um, really what we want to do, which is bring Silicon Valley level quality technology um, built for the Philippine market um, in an affordable and easy way. And um, I can just say that it's, it's been really great to see. I, I think that we have a lot of customers here on the call as well. So thank you for joining. Um, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing how a company can uh, really get to the next level. So um, what I plan to do today was really share with everybody the customer behavior um, from a data and um, data backed analysis. And part of this is because you know, everybody overnight has been going through such a fast transition of trying to uh, consume, understand, and make decisions as uh, SMEs. And so what I wanted to do was help um, empower you all with those kinds of decisions with some insightful data-backed um, uh, points of view. So here are some things that are interesting. If you really take a look at what's going on. Um, there is just massive impact across all industries. And so it's, it's, it becomes very clear that there's not a company size, there's not a company revenue, there's not a company location that's not being impacted. And this is a representation from the United Nations Industrial Development Organization that shows um, that basically every industry out there, if it makes you feel any better, is going through the same thing that we all are on this call. And if you bring it down here locally, uh, we realize, especially because the majority of our market is SMEs like yourself, we can see and feel um, that impact. And many of you on this call uh, represent a big part of the distribution of SMEs that are here in the Philippines, as you can see on this pie graph. And so that's really what we're trying to do is really uh, come together because this is an absolute serious impact where before we even talk about businesses, you know, there are people's lives at stake, families, loved ones, and every day you're hearing, um, you know, s stories of, of impact. And then when you get beyond that, it's very clear that jobs, um, people's careers, their businesses, and uh, even life savings or business savings um, are really being impacted. That being said, um, you know, I don't want to make this a doom and gloom. 
right? We're here to empower. And I personally believe, and I'm extremely passionate that um, in every market, yes, it can seem, it can feel bad, but there are absolutely um, winners in every market. And what we want to do is help people understand consumer behavior so that you can translate that into how you may be able to come out of this uh, crisis in a new and a better place. So let's look a little bit um, at history before we get to um, moving forward. Um, just to highlight that in every crisis, there are winners and of course, um, sad to say that there are losers. If you even go back to history, history shows and represents its large share of winners. Um, everybody knows one of the household name brands out there, Procter & Gamble, who's been around. And despite their size in that Great Depression of 1929 and 1939, um, they also felt the impact. But for them, instead of reducing their advertising or hiding or just waiting and seeing, there was something amazing going on with people at home. Uh, and in those days, they didn't have the internet but uh, they had the radio and they really um, put all of their money into and actually increased their advertising uh, that turned into, and I don't know if a lot of you guys know this, but p and is actually responsible for creating what is known as the soap opera because being a consumer goods company that uh, manufactured soap, they created these radio broadcasts and radio series that is what is known today as the soap opera or the teleseria or the k-drama that's where it came from is during the great depression and um hopefully you know we can all pray for our political leaders in our respective regions because i know we have some guests from uh, other countries around the world um there was also a uh, a government um, mandate called the New Deal, and this is going back to an example in the U.S. And uh, the presidential regime at that time um, really created a, uh, you know, a document centered around the New Deal, and this was all about encouraging um, in-country industrialism, and that's where industrialism really started, and that then fostered intercontinental and local trade. From then on, during that time of the Great Depression and thereafter, there were many, many new inventions, new innovations. The things that we take for granted today were back then revolutionary inventions, such as the ball pen, uh, even the, I know people have gone to digital recorders, but if you can remember the magnetic tape recorder, and of course the radio was just becoming uh, a big hit. Um, my personal favorite innovation, not sure if any of you guys know this trivia, but is the invention of the chocolate chip cookie. Yeah, that was uh, part of the Great Depression. So fast forward, and if you look at the, uh, the dot-com bubble that many of you uh, might have heard about, that was also a massive crisis from the period of 1995 to 2000. Um, there were also a lot of examples of many, many losses, many, many missed opportunities, but equally there were lots of wins. Uh, there was a company, I don't know if any of you guys remember, remember, it was a search engine called Excite. They actually had the opportunity to acquire and buy Google at that time for a mere $750,000. Now, obviously, that's a lot of money to um, a lot of people, but when you look at the value of Google today, uh, that, I think, is a great example of uh, opportunities, right? If you fast forward, fast forward and you forward, might have invested you. money, uh, there's a little echo. If you might have invested some money at that time, after, uh, right after the dot-com bubble, you would have made, uh, probably a hundred times your investment 
uh, in the next 10 to 15 years. So there's, uh, again, more examples of winners. Um, more recent uh, crisis, uh, which probably a lot of people do remember on this call, uh, which has to do with the housing crash. And this was really, you know, even though a lot of these examples are centered around uh, the US, um, clearly these crises uh, of this magnitude are felt worldwide. And here we are today facing a sim similar scenario. And uh, um, the, the real estate and housing crash of 2006 and 2008 obviously created a lot of ups and downs. Um, but after the real estate crisis, um, there was a lot of people who really won because many people who could not afford real estate at its peak now found the bottom of the real estate market. They were able to buy in, get in, and see the gains from 2008 up until 2019. So with almost every industry out there, there are gonna be winners. And again, sadly, there are gonna be losers, um, but that's what we're here for today is to figure out how we can all evolve, endure, and adapt to hopefully becoming uh, on the winning side of this. Um, some of the lessons learned there, in my opinion, are really quite simple. Um, and that's innovate and take action. Um, easier said than done, so uh, let's drill down and figure this out. Um, for those of you that are customers on the call, um, many of you are very familiar with uh, the rigorous exercise um, that we really drive home for all of our customers and for our entire community. We're, we're super happy just to help people and give them as much and uh, as any free advice as possible. In fact, we'll, we'll tell you exactly everything that you should be doing in case you're not. But one of the things that we really try hard to uh, to drill into and that we suggest that each and every one of you drills into is understanding con uh, consumer behavior from your industry's point of view. And uh, no, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I uh, it's just one of my hobbies. I'm just one of those people that observes and likes to people watch, as they say. And with that, I also do research to help prepare myself for understanding how to navigate the waters for our own business. And so there's something that I came across that I really try to implement and give as a guiding light to our customers, which is the buyer persona. And it's really centered around, um, you know, science around something called the cognitive tri triangle. And this is where consumer behaviors um, and their, their actions are all generated from thoughts. Sounds pretty obvious. Um, but it's, it's something that's really important um, to understand despite how simple it is. Because the way people behave, the way they respond to you with every marketing campaign, with every call, with every touch, with every interaction, it creates a domino effect on how they feel. And those feelings combined with the thoughts that you um, help them react with is what results in the behavior that they take. So everybody today on this call I know is contemplating um, the impact of their business and how their customers um, might behave and respond. So I encourage you to take a look at your customer behavior, take a look at it from the past, accept the realities of today and reshape um, your messaging to invoke and drive feelings that could increase the chances of the, the your customer's uh, behavior. So what's really interesting is that if you look at customer behavior and you look at the current crisis that we're in, especially compared to the crisis from, you know, the three that I gave that were obviously quite huge, um, this crisis, as you've heard probably, has happened much, much faster. Nobody was prepared. In fact, I would say it happened basically overnight. And I can't emphasize how quick 
consumer behavior has changed without any preparation. Um, think about the, again, going back to the uh, behavioral triangle, think about uh, our country's messaging prior to the coronavirus. What was it? It was all about build, 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 high GDP, high growth, industry boom, travel, um, uh, Pogo, real estate, everything was, was booming. Then, you know, even myself, I'm guilty. Fr Friday, March 13th, I thought everything was gonna be fine. I thought we'd be back in the office after a week. Um, but in one single night, everything basically came to a crash. So I wanna share some real data-driven examples about consumer behavior that we believe is really important for people to understand. So here are some data-driven examples. I did some research along with our research team and we looked at several categories and I didn't wanna just listen to the news. I wanted real data. I wanted to see it. I wanted to measure it. I wanted to understand exactly what is going on. And that's what the power of the internet and technology can do. Um, if any of you have not ever used or maybe stumbled upon um, something called Google Trends, you can use Google Trends and search data like this. Because let's face it, the use of the internet has absolutely increased and everybody has access to this information. So again, let me reemphasize the use of Google Trends. And um, although I am a small stockholder in Google, <laughs> it's not, using Google isn't going to make an impact on that. Um, but look what I found, right? Even I, I had a trip to Barakai amidst right in the middle of this lockdown. Google topic searches on Barakai flights pre-lockdown up until the end of 2019 was on a climb, right? Now look what happened. Here's the data. This is not the media. This is not Dennis Velasco. This is measurable, tangible information. It's funny here because if you look at the dates, even up until the announcement of the lockdown, I have to admit, I was still searching travel. I'm a bit of an opportunist and optimist. And I thought, oh, this is great. I was an opportunist because it's summertime coming up. And I thought, oh, in a week or two, this will be over. And I'll be able to take my family on a great affordable vacation to Barakai. I'm sure some of you guys were uh, out there on the call were probably thinking the same thing. But then after the first 10 days of March, um, the consumer mindset dramatically had a massive drop off in their interest on traveling to even such an amazing place like Barakai. So that's an example of pre and post data on um, consumer behavior around travel. Let's look at some fun stuff. What about luxury items i was trying to think of what are all the rich people doing right has their life changed so i looked at some luxury brands and um i don't personally own anything by gucci but perhaps some of you on the call do <laughs> but um this was interesting so um while gucci does still remain to be strong as you can see it was on a uh, rise and then things started to taper off. Uh, but post lockdown, look at what happened. Google Trends shows interest in uh, luxury related products like Gucci, and there is a massive drop off, even for people who have money. Now I know we've got some folks here in the real estate industry. Uh, and I know there's a lot of activity and webinars, and I think that's fantastic that the industry is getting together. Um, but again, I would come back to data. 
in order to understand your your customer especially in times of chaos um, data can be very very powerful and with the internet there's a lot of um, reliable meaningful useful data but look at the boom of real estate can you guys see that and then literally march 11 march 13 it's just a massive drop off i'm sure some of you guys uh from real estate i see some folks from hopler and we've got some customers on the line here too um you're probably sensing this but you're still probably scratching your head going i wonder what the customer is thinking so this data hopefully provides you with some insights on what's happening so our world today has absolutely changed and will it change forever um, this is what our world looks like and personally i don't think it's going to change um, a whole lot um, and i think it's really important that we also on this call go through that behavioral triangle to understand, accept, and take action. So um, based on our team's research, here's what we found. This is what we found um, that are consumers' top priorities. Now, when you look at these, now I would challenge each and every one of you to ask yourself, what can you do to change your messaging, to change your business model, to perhaps tweak your business plan um, to center around the messaging that invokes feelings, right? That center around health and safety first. What is your company doing to provide confidence that whatever product, whatever service, whatever employee they interact with, that when they work with you, they're working with a health and safety conscious company and are not putting their customers or their employees or their partners or their ecosystem at risk. What are you doing to help empower families like all of us who are stuck and getting used to the stay at home model? Entertainment is now being innovated as you'll see in some of the examples. If you look forward, even after the lockdown, I hate to admit, human beings are discriminatory animals that's the only way going back to science that we can make sense of dinosaurs of animals versus plants it's only when it's used negatively does it become discrimination in my mind it's all about categorization and so what are you doing in your category to create and bring your product and service to your customer so that you can create a more contactless product and service. So it's all starting to stem around convenience. And here's where I believe is the last but not least, but the biggest opportunity for every SME on this um, call is the difference in the separation these days of foreign versus local. And we'll drive into that concept here in a second, but I think that's where a big opportunity is. And it's always been a mantra of ours for those customers um, that have heard me talk about this before, but being hyper-local is extremely important because people always like to do business with their neighbor, right? So let's drill down and let's take a look at what are some of the new normal behaviors? What are some of the data-driven proofs that we, our research and data team came up with that supports these new um, important top priorities for consumers these days. So if you look at the, uh, the concept of safety topics, like the coronavirus test, as an example, that was, I think, cleared by this graph, it was in nobody's mind until those spikes you could um, directly relate to news casts and uh, published media on the coronavirus in China. So pretty much everybody had very little uh, acceptance 
of what was happening around their safety. They were not conscious about safety pre-lockdown. And we all know this because there was a lot of traffic still. <laughs> now, again, let's let the data speak for itself. Consumer behavior is being measured here post lockdown. And it's clear that people are conscious and trying to find ways on how to get tested for the coronavirus. Because we all are started to understand that we don't want a second wave of Corona. And we've already been educated that we must test first and we're all upset with the lack of tests so without making this a political speech you can see and let the data speak for itself and that's one example there that puts safety and health at the top of consumers minds and that's a message that it's extremely important that you in your business starts to wrap around here's another example of health look at this because um this is around the topic of exercise <laughs> now this is a positive result of the coronavirus and as i mentioned there are winners and losers and i think we will all win with a higher acceptance of exercise but approximately the second week of march health has become a top priority for every consumer growing by 75 percent based on the topic of exercise another great example what about home entertainment um again you probably don't need data to tell you this but for what it's worth and for good sme business owners and leaders um, they say good business decisions are not just um, qualitative but also quantitative so let the data speak for itself, right? So there's been a 75% growth interest in Netflix. Even home entertainment for kids. I looked at topics um, and this was one big one because Nintendo Switch has a uh, big following of younger uh, generation of kids. Their growth interest has even seen a spike of 60% just in the last 45 days. And compare 45 days, everybody, with the two or three years that it took for the housing crisis to really hit, for the 10 years of the Great Depression, for the five to six years of the dot-com. It's just happened overnight. So for all of you foodies out there, how important is consumer behavior when it comes to being a contactless business? Well, look at food delivery as an example. And I know Jeff Sarmiento, you definitely want to uh, stay tuned for his talk um, about fulfillment and delivery of products and services. But um, food delivery is clearly um, growing in interest. More data. The interest of essentials. Look how, how flatline and how low the interest was prior to March. And then all of a sudden, the online activity around online grocery, and I think Carlos had mentioned that earlier, is measurably um, growing and growing very fast. So this starts to build on each other and we're starting to get overall concepts and themes around delivering convenience. So convenience, everybody it does it really 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 does matter and personally for me i'm super happy about that because you know i love the culture and having moved uh to the philippines has been amazing but i have to admit we have a lot of uh friction when it comes to convenience and uh, one of the good things that i'm looking for is imagine if the entire sme and business population which we all know is the majority of every economy morphs evolves their business to provide more convenience to the customers all that means is we all win consumers customers of every industry i don't care if you're in real estate or if you're in a traditional brick and mortar business if you're in the co-working space business there's a way it might be a little different it's going to feel awkward but there is a way 
to bring your products and services to your customer's home or closer to them. Just look here at Lala Move. They are an example. Because if you want something so bad, you don't even have to have a delivery service connected to your Facebook store. You can just ask the customer if you really want to buy our product, please schedule a Grab Taxi or Lala Move. As you can see here by this graph, Lala Move is extremely <coughs> and positively impacted by uh, consumers wanting products and services to be delivered to them. <coughs> Excuse me. I am in good health, by the way, luckily. <laughs> so, um, hold on. Okay. So now, uh, hopefully, amidst all of the media and news and hype and story and information out there that might be who knows real or fake what my goal was is to deliver insights on consumer behavior that's backed by data um, so now hopefully some of you all have uh, seen and really just validated a lot of your thoughts that i know each and every one of you is already experiencing but now we get to the question is is this long term and that's one of the things i'm curious to hear about when we get to our round table. But um, as you guys can see, I'm a data person. So, <laughs> so let's see what some of uh, our analysts and data team has come up with to either prove or um, this theory of long-term or call it false. <clears throat> well, this becomes interesting. Uh, we saw an interesting uptick and spike on the concept and topic of freezer. So freezer related products, because think about it, we just showed you, <clears throat> and again, nobody has a crystal ball. We're trying to put all these behaviors together and make sense of them based on data instead of guessing. So we already learned that consumers want products coming to them. We already learned that essentials are really important. Now, we're learning that people are looking for um, products and ways. And I would argue that by buying a freezer, consumers can store more essentials or food in their homes. I believe that people are preparing for this to be the new norm, the new normal. I believe people, consumers, are preparing for the long term. And if you looked at all my data, guys, this is not world data. This is Philippine data. This is here in our country, in your backyard. I know this is just one small example. Let's look at some examples on e-commerce. I'm sure we have, uh, I can see some of our friends, family, uh, customers, partners, um, really heavily focused on the e-commerce industry. Obviously, there's a lot of opportunity there, but let's let's use this time to um, peel the onion back. Everybody knows a company called Lazada, and this is not a bash on Lazada. This is just the data speaking for itself. Um, Lazada has been doing very well, but amidst the lockdown, again, I didn't make this up. Um, this is there on Google Trends. The data showed me that there's been a downward trend on the interest of Lazada. So again, I'm curious to hear from some of the folks and feel free to chat it out there or um, voice your opinion at the, uh, at the panel. But my personal belief is if you look at Lazada, yes, there's a lot of local products, but um, Lazada has clearly opened up the international trade and with the big drop shipping movement of products from uh, outside countries, primarily China, that consumer interest is going down. There's probably a lot of reasons um, and it's probably a more complex scenario. But again, to me, I'm trying to make sense of this, putting this data together to figure out how, even though there's gonna be a lot of winners on e-commerce, how do I make sure I increase my chances of winning on e-commerce. 
Should I get products from abroad, right? And now here's the good news, I think, for everybody on this call, right? So if Lazada may not be winning as much, who is the winner? Who's the winner of local versus foreign trade? Well, <laughs> whether you like it or not, Facebook Marketplace obviously has been quite strong for a long time. But again, look at what happened in that specific period of March, the second week of March up until today. And the majority of people searching on the Facebook Marketplace are looking for local trade because Again, some of the bigger guys, and I'm curious what Jeff uh, Sarmiento thinks of how some of the bigger e-commerce players are really um, gonna be able to tackle logistics because everybody has um, policies and constraints to the government uh, lockdown, right? But I can hop on Facebook Marketplace and make a deal with somebody. I, in fact, I did this to um, get a uh, mini micro, or whatever you call it, micro uh, um, SD card for my son's Nintendo Switch because I had to download a bunch of games for him because he was getting tired of his old games. And he was, um, anyway, badgering daddy. And so, of course, I looked, I first thought I could find this on Lazada. I, they couldn't ship it. In fact, I'm still waiting for my extra set of uh, HD webcams. That's now going on uh, 45 days to be exact, not yet delivered and prepaid via credit card. Um, but what I was able to do was find somebody on uh, Facebook Marketplace and I arranged our own transportation, right? To get that SD card. So in this scenario, I believe that everybody on this call, this is the big opportunity for the SME community for our country is local trade. Business to business, business to consumer. This is your time. This is your chance to be the winner in this equation, right? Again, look, um, I know everybody complains about the internet here in the Philippines, and uh, it's true, it's, it needs to improve. Um, and it needs to improve fast, because um, if you're still not sure how your business can get from traditional to online, it's really important. And I hope I'm emphasizing the importance of understanding the behavioral triangle, using data, because the reality is, here's the online growth in the Philippines. Check this out. In the last 45 days, this is the percentage growth based on Statista, another online free uh, data analysis tool that's available for every SME, every business of any size. This is the growth of what's happening with technology in the Philippines. WhatsApp and Facebook messaging activity has increased by 55%. Social media with Facebook and Instagram uh, has increased 71%. My friends at Kumu has obviously also been increasing. I did some research on theirs. Theirs is increasing double digit growth um, alongside the, the TikTok um, um, whole thing. And uh, Netflix, even though they're the international player, iFlix has also been winning on this. Um, online gaming um, has increased by 40%. People are listening to more music and even the podcasts, right? Podcasts are a great way to get your product, your service into the minds of your consumers amidst the lockdown, just like P&G did when they were creating the soap operas. But the great thing is podcasting is almost free, right? So local trade. And here we are just coming up to summarize and I'll pass it over to Judy. But I really want everybody to think about um, these takeaways that uh, online is absolutely your friend as an SME. It will be faster for you to get started Technology is much more affordable than ever before. I've shown you data that customers want you. They want your products and services in a repackaged local um, manner if you can get it to them. And so 
that is the new normal. It's safety first. It's positioning your company, delivering that message of health and safety first. It's delivering your products and services to people's homes, centering and building a aspect around your business that provides some kind of entertainment and absolutely um, creating more processes that create a more contactless environment that results in convenience. And with that, I personally believe that if we take action, the local trade, the SME community has an opportunity to contribute more to the gross domestic product than ever before of this country and probably every other region around the world. So um, last thing, this is what you can do about it is think about the concept of winners and losers. And I'm sorry, uh, I, I might be direct in some times, but um, I'm a bit of a fixer. And the easiest way for me to look at it is, you know, draw a straight line and figure out what side you want to be on. So think about what you can do to get on that side of being on the winning side. And it's going to take innovation. It's going to take making changes. It's going to take moving fast. And um, I will say that there will be more competition online. So it's really important that your branding be uh, a top priority for you. And as a result, you will find ways to deliver a better customer experience. And I think we all know, because everybody on this call is a consumer, that customer experience always wins. So uh, before I turn it over to Judy, um, at our company, Prosperna, I did want to do what is our part to contribute, contribute to the SME um, uh, economic stimulus. Uh, I know there's not enough of it going around. I wish there was more. Um, and I know with uh, communities like Bounce Back, PH, um, as well as all the people in that community and uh, Kubo Innovation and everybody on this call, we can contribute to improving. But from a Prosperna standpoint, I invite everybody. We have a range of uh, small to medium enterprise stimulus packages to help you transform your business online. All you need to do is go to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Prosperna. And even if you don't buy anything, we'll help you. We don't care. We just want to see our community rise to the top and bounce back Philippines. Just put a comment and add a hashtag Prosperna SME and um, we'll do whatever we can to help you stimulate your SME business. Thank you, everybody. Carlo, back to you. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, I hope everyone learned uh, so much insightful information through Dennis's talk regarding customer behavior during the new ECQ and the new normal. Uh, again, I uh, just want to give a few reminders of the house rules. Uh, first and foremost, if you guys are during this, the speaker's presentation, please, uh, as much as possible, mute yourself or avoid yourself from talking to, this, to less distract the speakers who are presenting. Uh, again, feel free right now, you can start putting your questions in the chat box. Uh, if you have any questions regarding the previous speaker, you can start asking questions now. We have a few more minutes before we move on to the next speaker. So if there is anyone who wants to ask Dennis a question, please feel free to add it in the chat box. Or if you want to unmute yourself, please do so. So you can start asking the question to the Uh, question about being recorded. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the session is being recorded. Thanks, Camille. Uh, maybe I can kick things off first by asking the first question. Uh, now you're talking about everyone moving online and everyone trying to uh, do everything online versus local and international markets, right? Uh, maybe my question here is how do you different, differentiate yourself from your other uh, online market uh, competitors for people who are all moving online now? How do you make yourself unique compared to the other competitors? Yeah, because um, 
it's great to see a lot of uh, there's amazing number of new startups online and just shows how easy it is to get online um, so there will be and be prepared for more competition um, so I believe that you know as a customer first um, driven company that really at the end of the day the consumer is the person that makes the decision and typically you know people make decisions based on great service a product and they typically spend more or are willing to spend more for in with a person or with a business that actually has a brand or some kind of passion or cause around that brand. So um, that's one way that you can differentiate yourself. And I think people have to realize that consumers are very, very smart these days and they're gonna do their background check um, and expect that, expect people to do their background check um, online. So you should be present on every channel as much as possible. You know, Facebook, Instagram, um, Carousel, your own website, um, you know, your own YouTube channel. Most of these have some level of, of, of a free concept, you know. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, uh, John, you have a question. Feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Dennis, thanks for sharing those data. Um, so what would you say to, to someone who say uh, who is a low-tech low Filipino, um, but he sees from uh, the horizon the inevitability of the digitalization? Because I believe that the Filipino, the Philippines, although it's becoming an entrepreneurial um, landscape because of our influence from the West. I think the majority of the people are still um, employment or employed. So that, that employment mindset. And it's just so scary to, to, to jump into the unknown world, although you know that it's the next big thing. But if you don't know where to start, let's say you have a, um, a passion or a hobby that can be profitable, and, but they, you don't know where to start. You're like a deer in the headlight, like paralyzed. What would you say is the lowest hanging fruit for them to at least um, pick up momentum for the next, say, three to six months from now? Yeah, good question. And I think that's real life thinking. Um, and that's, uh, I think the, um, you know, technology, in order to be successful at any size company or at an individual level, again, just going back to the behavioral tri triangle, it takes the right mindset. So once you're willing to accept technology and hopefully the data shows this, then I would keep the action and my response to your question really simple. Um, that's number one, use our friend Google. Again, I'm not promoting you know Google, but <laughs> it's useful, right? Lots of information out there. Number two, go out and find a coach. Go out and find someone that you can be comfortable talking to. And sometimes it's a friend, it's a peer. If you are a current employee and um, you should have a coach internally, it doesn't always have to be your boss, right? It can be somebody externally. Um, I see a, a ton of great momentum on people doing the research for you and offering many kinds of coaching services. So, because research before you take action is really important and that research takes time. So by getting a coach, you're really um, getting the, uh, you're getting the experts to do a little, of the, a little of the groundwork for you. And that's really important for scale and speed. Again, at any level, I don't care if you're a big company, medium, small, you know, uh, if you're, um, you know, an employee that lost their job and it needs to start their own business. Those are two things that you can do. Absolutely. Well, let's say three mindset, Google and a coach. You're off to the races. So, so just a quick uh, follow up question there. Like, let's say um, if they can, if they cannot find like an individual coach because, um, because um, probably it might cost an arm and a leg, but is there like a community that you would that you would recommend or probably an, an ecosystem where there's just some community spirit there for some rubbing on of, of each other's shoulders. 
I think there's, um, yeah, right here on this call, there's about at least 50 of them. Some of them are guest participants. So guest participants, please introduce your company into the chat, right? Because uh, nobody is short of uh, getting access to more options, right? Um, I think you have uh, Carlo's organization, Kubo Innovation Hub, QBO Innovation. Please check them out on Facebook. They also have a co-working space in Makati. Honestly, I didn't know that they were around. They reached out to me and I was like, oh man, this is awesome. I didn't even know this whole world of resources existed, right? And you know, uh, so far I haven't paid a dime to Kubo. <laughs> There's probably a big check coming or a big invoice, I don't know. Um, we also have, uh, you know, uh, Judy at My Boss Asia. Right. And, um, you know, Monster Hub down in Makati, um, they offer a lot of coaching sessions on accounting and finance. Um, mm -hmm. Jeff from the logistics. I know that's why he always starts every sentence with, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm so busy. Right. Because he's helping as many people as he can understand the logistics world. And then, uh, you know, our company, of course, you know, we are publishing uh, complete detailed how to guides on our YouTube channel. So that's all free. And of course the bounce back pH is amazing. I know that they are building a database of um, products and services and stimulus packages. I looked at that database and there was already hundreds, um, you know, of people on there offering many, many coaching services, you know, and a lot of it's pretty affordable. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate the answer there. All right, John, thank you so much for your question. We have one last question here from Brandon. Uh, his question is, I'm pretty sure many here are interested to know how much does it take to bring their business online, uh, CapEx-wise and OPEX-wise. Uh, so I think this is more for you, uh, Dennis, uh, about how you can also help them using your platform. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, and I'd also be curious what Judy's, um, Judy might have an opinion also from an accounting standpoint on, you know, what, you know, what average startup costs might be. Um, but you could use everything from, uh, again, I'm sorry, I, I keep bringing up Google. They should pay me or, uh, to be their sponsor, but Google sites, they have a free website builder and, uh, that's something that you can do without any coding. And yes, Prosperna, I believe, has the easiest website builder out there. But, you know, ours is a small investment, uh, quite affordable. But again, we deliver a higher service. So we deliver more of a we do it for you. But really, you could start a website and get online on uh, and have your own Google website using Google, Google Sites. You could have um, that uh, linked to your Facebook store, your Instagram page. Uh, so yeah, I mean, honestly, you can spend very, very little or you can, you know, the sky's the limit, right? Um, so I would just suggest you do some shopping and talk to a few uh, partners and see who you feel comfortable with, right? It does take time to procure and evaluate the best partner. So you should do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Sorry. We have one more question here. Uh, hi, Dennis. Enjoyed and learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you. Aside from creating a more established impression for your company through a website, what are what its other advantage over a Facebook page if the latter is more accessible to Filipino consumers who are constantly on Facebook? Oh, okay. So what's the difference in Facebook and your website advantages, pros and cons? I'm gonna take that a little bit broader also, because we get this question all the time, why do I need a website? Or what's the difference in Lazada or um, Lamudi, uh, whatever industry there's, you have what you call marketplaces. The Facebook marketplace, or the Facebook shop, Lazada, Lamudi, Property24, Carousel, they're all under the category of marketplace. A marketplace is where buyers and sellers like a chunget, come together online. Just like a chunget, a marketplace, depending if you're the buyer or the seller, this might be good or bad. The purpose of a marketplace for consumers is to drive and get the lowest price possible. 
hopefully with a balance of the best service by looking at the reviews, okay? So again, if I was a supplier, it's good because marketplaces drive a lot of traffic. They do a lot of the um, online traffic generation for you. Um, the downside is, um, so that's a pro. The downside is there's a lot of competition. No offense to Facebook. I know it's um, pumping you up earlier, but it looks like a garage sale, right? And if you look at even Lamudi and Prop 24, all the houses look the same. So how do you differentiate yourself as a service or a company provider? That's where your own website comes in. A person that comes to your website is only focused on the value that you deliver, your story, your messaging, your branding, the quality of your products and services. So as long as your experience, your content, and what you offer and your messaging appeals to those characteristics of the new norm, then you increase your chances of winning more customers. Not to mention marketplaces um, can charge you a lot of high commission. So they can charge you up to 35% commission, which these days, and I'll let Judy speak to this, but 35% um, of anybody's bottom line is a lot of money, right? And you could promote your free website on your local community Viber group without paying that 35%, right? Um, not to mention, if you look at the legalities, and that'll be the last thing I say, because I can really drill into these things. <laughs> but um, on a marketplace, you don't own the customer. Based on the legal terms and conditions, um, they are not your customer. They are, because the money is collected not by you, it's collected by somebody else, and they pay you. You know, the they remit back to you the balance. So again, I think there is a place for marketplaces. I'm not saying they're all bad. I don't want you to get that impression. Marketplaces play a role in your initial entry into a new market because it can get you a lot of traffic. I would use marketplaces for um, lead generation, right? But I would quickly find a way to get my brand in front of them so they buy direct from me. That's not an old concept, right? That's the same concept of, oh, I'm, uh, never mind. I'm not going to try my Tagalog because <laughs> there's too many people on here, but I'm just going to go direct to the supplier, right? That's where your website comes in. So you don't have to pay the 35% next time. Hopefully that helps. Sorry, it was a little long winded. All right. Thank you so much again, guys. If you have other questions, please feel free to uh, wait for it. We will be having a panel discussion and a round table discussion after this. Uh, so you can follow up your questions there and ask more questions there. Uh, again, Dennis, thank you so much for giving that insightful uh, talk regarding customer behavior. Uh, now we can move on to our next speaker. Uh, I want to introduce again Judy, uh, the CEO of My Boss Asia, who will be discussing more about financial visibility during business slowdown. Uh, Judy, uh, you may have the floor. Yep. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. So the topic that I will be discussing is about yeah how can we assess our financial viability during business slowdown. So well during these very uncertain times, it is important for us to be able to clearly and objectively assess our business condition. So not only for our financial condition but also on our overall business situation. Okay. So, it is important for us to understand that our financial statements do not only reflect on our profitability and available assets. So, but more importantly, our analysis of our financial condition should point us to our company's operating efficiencies or inefficiencies. It should also show us that uh, if we are properly utilizing our assets and managing our liabilities, and should also show us our company's market potential and opportunities. So what will I share with you are based on my own experiences and my learnings from my mentors and business associates. So I will show you a framework, no? showing you this framework that we 
we will use with my, that we use with my team no, in assessing in our company's performance and how we use this assessment to come up with strategies and action plans. Okay, so yes, I'll be talking about the importance of understanding your viability requirements by eternally assessing your vision, mission, and your company's process. We'll go back again to the basics. And then we will relate the current situation happening in our environment and how this affected our operations. After we have discussed the internal and external assessments, now we will try to come up with strategies and action plans that will help us reverse this downward trend that most of us are experiencing. Okay, so basically our operations are composed of two segments. So that's the revenue side and the expense side. The more we understand what affects these two segments, the more we will be able to manage the financial, operational, marketing, and HR components of our company. So in our revenue side, we should ask what brings revenue to our companies. And if we are a multi-product or multi-service company, we should assess which, are, which is our top revenue earner or biggest profit contributor. Then we should able to analyze how efficiently we are collecting these revenues and the type of policies that we follow in our collection efforts. So because of the changes in market conditions and customer preferences, especially during this crisis mode, it will also be advantageous if we assess our ability to develop or produce new products to provide new services that are relevant to the current customer demands. So this will also require an assessment of you know, the availability of the manpower, equipment, and facilities that will ensure that we can maintain the quality. Okay? And of course, finally, we should also assess our current supply chain, which will include our suppliers and logistic providers. So now, um, when we assess our expense side, you know, first we should identify what are the fixed or recurring expenses that we have in our company. So let's prioritize it based on importance in terms of payment. So from there, we can assess if there is a possibility of deferment or better if we can get relief from these expenses. Maybe we can assess if we can downsize or outsource these expenses and second part secondly it's let's identify our variable or non-recurring expenses so which of these expenses can be deferred or discontinued if not can it also be outsourced so yeah and uh, finally the difference between our revenue and expenses will show us our profitability, our gas position. So based on this, we can assess that if we are half full, meaning we have enough cash until we reach our, an upswing in our revenue, or are we already half empty, meaning we don't have enough cash to sustain our operations until an upswing in revenues. So, well, at this point, uh, I would like to emphasize that in making our internal assessment, we should be as objective and unbiased so that we can clearly see the potentials of our business operations before we can assess the current state of the environment. So we have to take out our emotional side, no? the, the ideal um, or idealistic uh, vision for the company. We should. Um, but be more realistic and practical you know, with uh, how we will able to take with our take on under next steps. So um, now, if we are able to see how it goes in our internal assessment, so we can proceed now in our envi environmental assessment. So yeah, without being so emotional. Um, we can list down the current situation in the environment and how these are affecting the market conditions. 
On the revenue side, what is affecting us today is the COVID-19 pandemic that caused the implementation of ECQ and then we had the social distancing and even now the suspension of public transport. This eventually caused a drastic and sudden change in the customer demands and preferences like uh, what Danny showed us earlier. So, and of course, it also limited our access, no? the, the customer's access to our products and services. And on the supply side, um, depending on the industry that we belong to, we experience either a supply shortage or an oversupply of finished goods. So some experience price increases and logistical problems. And most of us also are now feeling the manpower concerns in terms of, uh, so of course, if the avail av availability and the payment, the salaries even without work. It's something that we all, it's also our responsibility we cannot ignore. So, if we are now preparing for the new normal once the ECQ is lifted, yet still we're not fully clear on how exactly it will be defined or implemented. And most importantly, how long it will last. Will we still be able to go back to the business as usual? Or Will it this be a permanent market environment? Still, we're trying to prepare as much as we can, but you know, we're still in that a little guessing game. So, well, I think what is certain though is that all of these factors will change the market demand and preferences. Payment behaviors, the marketing channels, as well as production and service processes. So now, um, considering this internal and external assessment, once we already plotted already, we should come up with these specific strategies and action plans. Well, the, the challenge is that we able to not just only flatten the curve, but reverse the curve towards revenue recovery and higher profitability. So here, um, this slide, I'm sharing you some broad actions and it will be up to you to determine how you can specifically apply it to your respective companies. So for example, for the short-term action plans on the revenue side, the very least, we should aim to sustain current revenue levels and eventually increase sales. We can do this by, well, we can do this by implementing promos, discounts, or we can also offer longer credit terms or better, faster deliveries to our clients. On the expense side, for the short term strategy, um, well, uh, we a little bit remove the, uh, the fun, so we eliminate some company perks or change benefits. Reduction, well, this is the hard part. You know? We have to reduce manpower uh, and downsizing of office space if necessary. So you can look at the alternative workspace or yeah, if, if, if your company can adapt the uh, work from home arrangements. So that are some short terms, meaning maybe eventually after this pandemic, we can turn it around again. Okay. So for the medium term strategy, uh, which means we're looking at what two to six months from the lifting of the ECQ for this year. So if we can increase our channel of distribution and marketing, in order to increase revenue. So for example, that's where this is the digital transformation or adaption of technology solutions will come in. So we can look at the e-commerce platforms. We can see if uh, our products or services can be relevant to mobile apps or 
we should really learn how to effectively use the social media marketing. We need to be present. No? We need to have a very good pre- uh, good branding in, in the social media. And that's for the revenue side. For the expense side, for our medium-term strategies, um, well, that's uh, you have to double-check uh, how you can cut down no, the regular expenses. So for example, utilities, um, representation, so and uh, yeah, travel expenses. One. Um, well, uh, if. if we can also suggest that outsourcing of non-core operations, uh, if that's something that you can outsource, uh, such as the finance and administration, advertising, or if there's logistical requirements, uh, even the project-based employment. Uh, yeah, if that can uh, give you a losing your budget, and that's one of the strategies that we can uh, look at. But of course, so from the short and the medium term, uh, that we're looking at as a, you know, a little bit of band aid solution. But of course, we have to also look in the long term strategy. Uh, so for example, for the revenue, so now we're we have to see if we have to develop alternative products and services that are aligned with new customer preferences or redesign the business model. This may include the restructuring of our operation processes, the workflow, or retraining our employees, our current employees, to enable them to do multitasking jobs. Well, we also recommend that the uh, you know, streamlining of your operations, so which you know, if, if, if it can adapt um, automation processes, so there are companies. There are outsourcing companies that can actually help you in these automation processes. And for your cash flow strategies, so the primary goal now is to maintain your liquidity. So the liquidity, so whatever cash you have right now, you have to be very tight holding on it because uh, for now, that's the only money that we have. It's the only the certain thing that we we have, and in case that we need it, we need to use it for more uncertain events. So that's the. So sadly, that uh, as as then saying, there's our winners and losers. So we have to sacrifice some things, part of the company, just for able for us to ensure that we can survive for next year. Then, you know. So this actually this uh, um, topic is uh, that's why you have to be very um, stable in your emotions and because it's really something that uh, it's really hard to uh, uh, decide also because you have to let go of some things that you know you you plan to do that's the very you thought of having that great vision for a company but now because of the current situation is it really still relevant or is it still doable so for you to able to survive today um, you have to sacrifice some plans um, or expansion or whatever that, you know you really have to hold on what we can have now, so that's you know, uh, it's really a, a hard um, thing to do as an entrepreneur, you know? especially the part of cutting, uh, downsizing the manpower because you know what, when we are putting up building the business, one of our purpose is to give employment to people to help them so that we can create a very uh, good nation building, inclusive growth to our country. That that that's what. You know, uh, an entrepreneur visualize, but now uh, because we want to save a big part, so we have to you know, uh, cut down, and uh, yeah, and they are people as well, so you know, it's really um, 
when you're an entrepreneur, you really have to have the guts to decide to not to be very careless in your decisions. So that that one. So yeah, in in the cash flow strategies, maybe um, in the short term, if you can defer payments, you no, know, for example, yeah, the landlords if they are very willing to help you out to, to to survive the business, if you can defer some payments, send sell unnecessary assets. So if you know, we, so uh, most of companies now have you know invested in. Nice furniture, just to boost the ambience of the workplace, of the people. But for now, we have to let it go so that we can turn it into cash. Or if uh, you Who's have a good, um, um, if you have a good uh, relationship with your suppliers, because of course they're also a business. So if, if you can talk about the credit terms, so you can both survive. <laughs> so that one, and then uh, in the medium term. So yeah, if we can borrow through loans, so if hopefully the programs of the government uh, will really give us uh, an immediate <laughs> um, lifesaver for the companies, for the SMEs, and also banks, if they would have some um, not so strict uh, rules or regulations, so that we can able to loan fast. That's one of the medium-term uh, uh, strategies you know, for the cash flow, and in the long term, yeah. Um, I mean, now um, what we're trying to invest is relationships with our fellow business, uh, with fellow business people. So, if we are looking at, you know, additional investments through partnerships or joint ventures, so that you know, both companies can survive. That that is one of the long term. So, but uh, yeah, I, I guess the important action plan today is just you know, hold whatever you have right now and make sure you spend it very wisely to to remain liquid. So that that one. So in summary, um, so summarize that for us to able to reverse the downward curve in our revenue generation and profitability. So first. We have to manage our liquidity position in the short term. Secondly, began to adopt digital transformation in our operations. That's one. That's really a must now. So, um, but yeah, you have to really evaluate that part because not all businesses can really adapt digital. And yeah, last for the long term. So the objective is, of course, you have to remain relevant to our customers because of their changing demands and preferences. So day one that you have set up your company, this is the customer profile, the customer journey. But you know, you're what day three hundred now, and uh, yeah, they are different now. They are also changing their um, behaviors and their needs. And also depending on the external environment that you know, we cannot really control, so we have to remain relevant to them, of course. So yeah, so well, in my closing, um, just want to share the quotation that I re- read from an article, McKinsey. So here, um, saying that your business context is and will always remain uncertain. Actually, even without this pandemic um, we really don't know um, if, if yeah the, the customer profile that you have built or that you have imagined will be still the customer that will buy you next year so just you have to get moving you, know? you can ride ride with the waves of uncertainty and yeah instead of being overpowered by them then we can be brave enough to Take the risk and plan it very well. So that's it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Judy. Again, guys, it's time now. If you guys have any uh, questions you want to ask, please feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself, and ask more questions. Or if you want, you can also send in your questions through the chat. Um, 
I actually have one question that I want to ask Judy before we open the questions to all the participants. Mm-hmm. You mentioned a lot of different action plans for SMEs uh, during your last slide or second to the last slide. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, how do you know which one you should focus on and which action plan they should choose to follow? Well, uh, of course, um, on the part of what you have today, you have to, you know, be creative. How you can maximize that—that's that's something that you have to focus on, and then see how it can uh, be improved by collaborations with others or how your customer is taking it, how they want it to be uh, transformed. Mm -hmm. A couple other things, if you don't mind me adding, and I'm sure if others uh, on the community have uh, learned some things that have helped them, you know, quite simply put, you know, even a digital and technology company like ours, you know, has to review the same things that Judy mentioned. And so by, if you just look at your expenses and really simply just drawing again, a line, a straight line up and down. And on one side, put the nice to haves. On the other side, put the must haves. So from an expense standpoint, look at that. Uh, From a revenue standpoint, one thing that we learned is we figured out what assets, what services, what skills, what people, what inventory, what do we have that aligns with the needs of the types of our customers and which one can we deploy fastest that will get us to that new revenue. So you have to basically, almost like a uh, rifle scope, be able to identify what you have that will get you closest to that next revenue. In times of crisis, you, I hate to admit, you have to look at, you know, just arm's length apart before you look at what's 10 yards ahead of you, a hundred yards ahead of you. Otherwise, sometimes people get stunned, you know, I don't know, Judy, if you think, uh, yeah. It, not being a complete accounting expert like you, that's kind of my simple way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I rely on the real accountants to actually uh, crush numbers <laughs> like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your thoughts on that, Dennis. Uh, Jam. Uh, yeah, you have a few questions you want to ask. Yeah, um, Judy, thanks for that um, strategy before you uh, jump into the tactics there. This just may be like a personal question to you because um, what what you would like to do when you have, uh, let's say, two product lines or service that are, that are still relevant, but in this day and age, like uh, in the new norm, when you focus on them, you know that you're going to be mm-hmm. like spread too thin or you might, you might burn yourself out. Um, so what would you personally do as a person? Because I think that a lot of entrep- entrepreneurs not only have one, one type of product or service, but also they may have several. But let's say, let's just boil that down to two. And then um, would, you, mm-hmm. would you just uh, get rid of the other one and focus on, on the one and then still feel bad because that was your brainchild in the first place? Like, I think both of them. Or would you, like Elon Musk, still just um, equally focus on these two like Tesla and and uh, SpaceX I guess but he was able to save mm-hmm. both of them but still I think that the, the effort that he had to put in and the, the pain that he was able to tolerate was so I think beyond uh, human uh, capability that he just he just he just um, ended up winning so what would you do would you get rid of the other one and just focus on on just one thing or would you rather if you have at least two um, still try to um, look after these two? Well, if you have a supportive partner, business partner, to help you still run both of these products, then it's very good. And you have uh, uh, the budget still to run both, then why not? But if you're just one and uh, 
yeah, you can only, you know, you need to sacrifice a little bit uh, to just hold on the other one. You have to evaluate those two products. You just have to choose what, you know, at during this time, what is that product that you want to be remembered? Hmm. That's Thank you. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions, again, if you guys have other questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. We'll be happy to answer it uh, after Jeff's presentation during the panel discussion. Uh, again, Judy, thank you so much for the insightful talk, giving different lessons and tactics that we can actually use for our different businesses and startups that we have. Uh, Jeff, uh, I guess now it's your turn. <laughs> are you ready? Yeah. Uh, you can now present uh, your, your presentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I actually created an outline, just an outline not to give a um, powerful presentation like the two right in front of me. So um, I just want to share my insights with regards to like how can a business um, uh, deliver their products and services during EOQ and after. Okay, so right here. So again, let me introduce myself. I am uh, Jeff, co-founder and head of business for Last Mile. Um, I'm an ex-banker. I'm an accountant, a supply chain professional, and I'm also an e-com seller. So I've been selling stuff online myself. So to give you an idea, a brief idea about Last Mile, we are a platform that provides logistics solutions to customers from different industries and different needs. So uh, we're not just like focused on e-commerce, we actually help different industries like food, traditional businesses, and um, even specialized uh, delivery businesses. So we have the uh, even logistics company are my customers too. So um, we have a platform like mentioned that actually helps businesses to operate. So for businesses who manage their own logistics operations and their own employees, um, like restaurants with their own rider. We're a company with um, a team of uh, a fleet of riders that delivers. We have Fleet.ph, a delivery management tool to manage and provide operational visibility to businesses. So it's a data driven platform that will provide business understanding on their capability, um, the cost per delivery, and how much capacity can they take right now. So it's a system for you to manage your own fleet of riders or messengers. Um, and also for businesses who would like to outsource delivery jobs to a third party provider. So some of them doesn't want to actually have their own riders dedicated to them and pass on the effort to a third party. So we have a platform that actually matches you to the perfect third party logistics provider to help you with the deliveries. And lastly, we have a platform we're in when business is actually scaling up and that's actually the hardest part. And everybody says it's a good problem, but it is a problem. So um, we have a platform that would actually help them scale up. So that's riders.ph. So we actually provide contractual deployment. So for example, I just need for a month, two days, one week. So um, we provide professional service provider to be deployed to their business to actually support their scaling needs. So those are the three products that we have for last month. So again, today, um, I was actually, um, I'll be discussing the topic on uh, delivering your products and services um, during and after ACQ. So um, COVID-19 has greatly affected the business of all industries in the Philippines, and it's ev evidently seen right now, right? So with the lockdown, no business, uh, especially if your business is not essential. So right now, uh, we've been very active as a logistics provider, partner, uh, so we're actually, um, logistics is actually playing a huge role during this period that we are facing and I'm here to share my insights and suggestions uh, with the learnings that I have on how business should sell their products and services during and after ECQ. So um, we've been actively listening and providing like, we actually even help businesses think of like a solution to actually make their business operate and listen to like the needs and complaints of businesses to uh, business group like bounceback.ph which is just very helpful. Everybody would like to help each other out in, in that platform. So yeah, if you're not a part of it, I really do suggest you join that platform. So um, a typical entrepreneur would ask himself, 
for their business, um, do we adapt or die? In this situation, um, COVID-19 is unmeasurable. As mentioned earlier, we don't know when it will end. Um, business would still pay for the rent, loans, fixed costs, employee salaries, most of them. Um, so those things needs to be paid, right? So, um, and in my opinion, the easiest way out to actually stop operating or stop operation is not the best way to cope with the current situation. So, um, from the start of the ECQ, um, there was an idea in my mind on like, um, because I've been seeing a lot of businesses saying like, we're closing down, uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. Um, I started pitching the idea of how we can actually help business to still operate, especially if your business ha- if are classified as essential. So, like, I was thinking of like, how can I actually help them still operate at this current status of the of the, of the Philippines? So, um, and that's that's something I'll be sharing to you right now. With this um, topics that I have. So, um, we've been always hearing it from the television, from the group that uh, we need to adapt to the new normal. So. Most people say that ordering products, services online and delivering it to their homes is a new normal. And uh, there is an apparent need now to create a new uh, way to offer goods and services online and deliver it to, the, to, to your customer source. So um, being online uh, or be, creating a way for you to actually deliver your goods to your customer source is the best strategy to cope and to still like sustain your business. And um, by doing so also, it will be a good solution for the ECQ, right? Like I've been telling a lot of my friends, um, we're in, uh, when government's giving like monetary support to people, it actually might actually add more problems because they would need to go out and use the money to buy you what they need. Unless, unless like, unlike actually finding a way to actually send or deliver goods to to end necessity to the people's doorstep. So that's what we are pitching and like and telling the business why not all of us help each other out to do this. So um, the best way to cope right now is to actually for a business we normally tell them is to enable delivery services. So um, as mentioned again this is the best time to explore deliveries as another business vertical to earn money and could go possibly go beyond ECQ. Especially if your products are essential, um, if you're selling like essential products um, declared by DDI and IAPF. So um, the common customers that we're serving are sourcing and selling, delivering essential products like medicine, um, multivitamins, and any health and wellness products. And also PPE, the um, sourcing of um, personal protective equipment from another country or another space or even producing them to actually supply uh, the frontliners and communities who need such uh, products. Another um, busy businesses that we're actually supporting right now are um, grocery shopping. So as mentioned, like I really do think this is the best way to actually um, help the country to keep people, uh, Filipinos at home by helping them, like um, by providing a way uh, for Filipinos to order online, and um, we'll help you with the fulfillment. So, uh, like delivering the goods to the, their, their doorsteps. And lastly, like one of the busiest customers even right now. So this is what we're keeping our team busy: uh, the food delivery industry. So we've been like onboarding, constantly onboarding restaurants and helping them out. Uh, to operate their delivery service to their customer. So apart from like the awesome service that um, Food Panda, Lala Food Grab Food is currently doing, um, there are still like a lot of businesses that would like to actually like explore doing it by themselves by creating a website with the help of Prosperna and our other partners on the web- website site and um, giving them insights and guides on how they could actually strategize on um, delivering the goods from their restaurants or from their houses to their customers. So there's a lot of like um, different models that we had so far up to this point since the start of ECQ we're in. 
um, every restaurant would have their different needs or, in, or different setups on operating. Some of them are operating on a cloud kitchen. Some of them are operating at their homes where there are restrictions here and there. Some of them are still operating on a restaurant and they're still restaurants and um, we're getting the goods from there and deliver it to the customer. So um, our role here that keeps us very busy is to actually guide them through, especially for those ones who are not used to offering such services. So um, hand in hand, um, uh, along with the products or the platforms that we have. So again, um, for business who has their own delivery riders, we actually guide them how to actually manage them and utilize them or somewhat incentivize these riders who are still working right now. So um, we have restaurants customer uh, who has their own riders and um, they really do appreciate the effort that their uh, riders or their team, their unit actually does um, despite with the, the whole scenario, not because they're desperate that they need money, but because like they're also like contributing to help the business still operate and cope with the current situation. So um, along with the deployment of the platform, we actually guide them through how we can actually men measure and manage well this right these people, the, the kitchen, the riders, so they can actually um, obtain more income so they can share it back to the uh, to their frontliners to their employees so um food delivery has been very busy because like for the obvious reason like me um i don't have any way to buy my ingredients in the supermarket unless i had to queue for four hours outside the grocery store for me to get in and then another like few more hours to actually buy my stuff and queue to check out and that would actually expose us to you know like to the germs like we don't know if we're gonna wire them while they're queuing while we're inside the supermarket and all. so if there's a way for me to actually order online and just buy food from the delivery uh rest from the restaurants i'll do that um a lot of people who doesn't know how to cook like myself um do, don't, do not want to bother to prepare food ourselves so we're very reliant to like restaurants who actually deliver the goods to our house and um, and yeah, and a lot of like professionals who are still busy during this period would like to have food delivered to their doorstep instead of them preparing. So um, currently, we've been actually creating a lot of opportunity to solve the food, the restaurants or the home-based book delivery needs um, by listening to them, telling like acquiring what they want and giving them like different strategies to operate. So um, for for businesses that does delivery, um, definitely there are the different uh, situation. One would be being a uh, business who has their own riders. So what we do, as mentioned earlier, we provide them a tool, the fleet.ph, to actually uh, manage their deliveries and maximize their employees' time by actually by by optimizing the routes, uh, measuring like how many minutes. Um, the efficiencies of the riders can actually do in a day. Um, if, uh, if, like, we pretty much what we do, we bring out the best for these employees, especially for the delivery riders. And still, if these riders um, are not, like, the available riders are not enough to actually sustain the demand, uh, we, we scope the demand and then we provide them, like, options. So it's either, um, we add more riders in from our partner manpower agencies or we match them with our um, awesome partner of on-demand delivery service providers with few clicks. So it could be Lalamove, Tokitoki, um, or other on-demand service provider like we can ship. So um, I think it was mentioned earlier that in Marikina, there were like small groups of uh, community who wanted to actually enable their like um, the riders in the community or few on cast riders who doesn't have a job right now to work as a community delivery service provider. Um, with that being said, we do actually have um, help few communities like that to, to, to start and work as such a community delivery service provider. So by providing them a system and uh, walking through how it works and eventually they were able to figure out how can they how can they actually provide these customers a channel to request delivery services and have a visibility on um, what's happening to their delivery 
um, another thing when a business doesn't want to have their own rider, so we provide them delivery page. So um, in an easy onboarding with Prosperna or any other e-commerce if they have their own, a simple integration would actually activate such service. So whenever their customer checks out, um, they mark it as yes, everything is available, so everything is fulfilled. Seamlessly, a job will be created with their preferred partner provider. So now they can actually offer delivery services and reach out to their customers at home. Um, also, like if they would like to explore delivery and um, they have no idea how it works, uh, we seldom offer um, why not acquire it from our manpower agency partners who actually knows how to operate the delivery team. And these manpower agency partners that we have, they actually guide these businesses on how to manage their delivery. So a good story is like, or uh, a common story for our customer that starts their delivery services from nothing, from no experience at all to now. Um, from day one, they were actually expecting, they were aiming to target 10 deliveries per day. Um, but the rider, because of like, the familiar, like they're still trying to get used to, to the whole process. They're doing like, they, on day one, day two, they're doing seven to eight deliveries per day. And uh, when they reach the day four, when things are getting more familiar, dashboards are getting more familiar, um, how to manage a rider, and the rider even is getting more familiar. Um, like it was was awesome to see like 15 deliveries in a day, even though like the deliveries are scattered everywhere in Metro Manila. So that's an impressive growth from um, a seven delivery to 15 for one rider. So. Uh, those are the good stories that we have and experience with our customer that we actually enable the delivery services. And along with that, with, with the services that uh, enabled, that has been enabled, um, because these riders are coming from um, a reputable and experienced delivery service team, uh, these riders are uh, giving insurance to their goods. So they make sure and they assure the customer that um, um, these items will be delivered in good condition otherwise they'll be responsible for that so um, we find a way to provide this customer um, a confidence to actually start and operate their delivery services so um, this keeps us um, up day and night and explore like every business has their own business process and business needs so um, you, you like normally find like was what was mentioned earlier it's best to find someone who can actually provide you uh, a professional insights or a guidance guidance on um, how can you approach things or like if you want to pivot from a normal traditional um, depend food traffic dependent business to a delivery service um, best is to look for someone or read stories on um, how a business pivoted from a traditional to online or delivery. So with those things, I could actually offer our teams um, time to actually scope what you need, uh, what is your budget, what are your expectations on uh, enabling the delivery services. So that's what we normally do. That's why we're very busy, but we're happy to, to see progress on our customers. Um, another thing um, at this point, um, during the ECQ, um, what like if you're not really selling products and you're selling services? Um, I've been like reading through a lot of. Um, I, sorry, if I may go back to the delivery for for those ones with goods, um, I would really encourage you to like this is the best time to explore because this might be something you can actually do or have as a vertical moving forward even after ECQ. So yeah, we can we can actually help you. Like with last mile can actually help you explore that direction with the help of Prosperina being an online platform give you like a brief idea on the overhead how many people do you need to actually operate the business and then um, going out of my uh, possible expertise of delivery um, if you're on a service part um, I've noticed that um, there are a lot of services that can be offered online remotely even though like you're not uh, not facing the customer so one of them is like even though it involves logistics public services there like bill management um, 
services like uh, we can actually help people to pay their bills even though they're they're at home um uh there are things that you can do like consultancy um there are like you can offer like if you have a team and you still you still like to operate and you have like a team who can who are capable to do marketing and selling so you can offer your team to do you can pivot into um, a virtual assistance to do sales for businesses who are like still operating right now and by doing so you, you will add more flexibility to, to this team um i've been watching a lot of like being an e-commerce guy i've been watching like i know drop shipping um i've been watching a lot of clips in youtube about like um drop servicing which is like a lot of people are trying to push now we're in um we can actually connect service providers who are still operating or like you can be that service provider you can go online and look for drop service partners who can like reach out to a lot of businesses or you can be that drop service um, platform that you can actually aggregate all the services and sell it to, uh, to business people. right so there's a lot of opportunity and like um, creating a website, creating an e-commerce. Like, I suggest creating a catalog of your services and your offerings, and um, provide a way for your possible customers to reach you, to reach out to you by clicking a few buttons and eventually like let the website work um, and offer your services to them. So I really do suggest that. I've been seeing like a lot of like um, stories about that. We're in from traditional, they went online even during ECQ and things were different. So they were able to explore new vertical um, during, despite with this of the community. So, um, yeah, so that's actually my short share on um, how I suggest and through my experience with the current situation and how we are helping businesses to go online and manage their op like operator deliveries with lesser risk because like they've been guided guided by someone who who've been like in this industry and been studying in this industry uh, for quite a bit on how they can actually operate their logistics service and reach out to their customers at home. So if you have any questions or if you'd like to get our services or you'd like to explore and how you'd like to take this new model, you can actually message me. Um, if it's a platform, I can actually match you with our partners like Prosperina. Like uh, we've been working with few customers already on live. Uh, we've been like servicing customers um, from no deliveries to like good number of deliveries, and they're adding more riders to it because they know they can actually deliver more food to their customers. So yeah, I'm open for customer uh, for questions. I'm open for customers always, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that man. That's great. <laughs> but wait a minute. So Jeff. Man, you guys are doing so many things, and uh, dude, it's so awesome to see. So basically, you guys have a logistics platform, technology, and you're also creating jobs at you know at local levels and giving new opportunities. That's what I think is super cool. Correct. You know. So that's um, the objective one, the initiative that we have with Boss Back because like we don't want people to lose their jobs and run out of money so um, we wanted to create employment safely and we do believe like by doing an online like activating the online delivery with um, with with a certain protocol that would protect the employees and the riders and the households actually be a solution for a lot of people right now yeah um can you for everybody because what you do is also quite new and some people sometimes don't know exactly how their product gets from the supplier to the customer can you give um, if it's okay um, like a use case example of, you know some I don't know I guess you, you mentioned there's a lot of restaurants right and uh, I think we're doing a couple restaurants together uh, I can't wait till gringos um, I think they're gonna launch this Friday or Monday Right. And because uh, I'm, I, I need some of that Gringo's food, you know. <laughs> but um, so, give a real life example. Like, describe for us 
what happens when someone goes to the online store and they order it, then what happens behind the scenes? Okay, the easiest story would be a restaurant, okay? So, for example, a restaurant who is not on any, any other platform um, actually would like to still operate right now and offer their food their, their, to their customers at home. Um, what we normally suggest is for them to go online and then we guide them through like what are the options and like what do you expect when you go online, how do you manage it, like what's the process. And then um, that online platform will be integrated to a server and that's us. So our service is actually to understand their like uh, typical customer area. So for example, like uh, this restaurant in QC, normally they have um, uh, patrons from uh, nearby cities like Quezon City, uh, San Juan, Manila. So we profile their needs and then we provide them like if it's like um, and then we ask them like how many how many orders do they expect to have during um, when they go online. So uh, we provide them options. So one is to match them with our partner providers who offer delivery services, all equipped with um, food grade boxes, a fleet delivery management system, motorcycle, gasoline, and uh, approved, and even um, licenses to operate during this um, period. So uh, that's what we do. So we were telling them if we deploy one rider to your business, all you need to aim is X number of deliveries and you can recover or even turn it up the logistics service or um, logistics solutions that you're offering to your customer. So they can connect with your platform and have access to many delivery service providers through one place. And then based on you know, where their customers are, how often and what type of deliveries, your software will basically do all the thinking for them to make sure the product gets picked up and delivered. Right? I think Jeff disconnected. Jeff? Oh, okay. I um, thought I was frozen. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i think just disconnected uh maybe now uh since uh while we're waiting for him to reconnect maybe we can actually open up the floor for a few of the questions that you want to ask for dennis or judy uh so feel free to ask oh okay there uh jeff uh dennis was actually qu asking a question a while ago regarding uh about your platform so his question was more on so any offline business or any business who wants to partner up with you, they can partner up with you and you'll be able to provide them an online uh, fleet management or even provide third-party riders who can pick up their products and deliver it to their customers? Correct. Correct. So yeah, so that's normally what we do. Like we provide solutions. So we enable business delivery services by doing so and we do suggest like um, they can actually do it manually by including requests in the platform or um, they can have their own e-commerce uh, solutions with, like we will tell them right away like we have partners who can actually enable your e-commerce in a span of like two days or one week at most because we are we are already integrated with them so like prosper now so yeah, so it's either we provide them um, a dedicated delivery riders to do their deliveries and then guide them through how to manage them so they can make it to their target and uh, the quality of delivery that they're expecting. Or we can match them with on-demand partners that we have like Lalaboo. So those are the two options. Or you can mix and match. So um, if your dedicated rider cannot really deliver, um, on a click of a button with fleet, it will be outsourced to your preferred on-demand delivery partner. So everything is being addressed seamlessly. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's okay. a huge enabler so for the Philippines. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, again, guys, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat, or if you want to have other questions, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Jeff, I actually want to ask you one question in particular. Uh, now that we all know everyone's working from home, even your whole team is working from home, how are you able to cope with the increase of demand uh, uh, from the people or from the restaurants that are applying to be in the platform? Okay, so um, number one with my team. So we already like prior to ECQ, we've been 
like we know the product very well, so the team would know how to approach the whole situation and how to assess customers' needs. Um, number two, prior to EZQ as well, we already built a strong uh, partnership with different uh, logistics partner and manpower agencies that they know what's their role whenever we deploy a service to a customer. Um, so with this current situation, um, uh, and lastly, we have our own deployed support group. So whenever we deploy uh, a service to a customer, um, we have a protocol that they have a hotline to reach out to whenever they have concerns or they would like to clarify such activities in the platform. So we have a 16 by 7 support that they can actually approach. And um, so in this situation, all we need to do is to approach customers and tell them like how we can actually solve their problem or how we can enable their delivery services right away. Because we have a clear story on um, um, on how can we start or enable a business delivery services and take orders online. So um, we're prepared prior to ECQ. That's why I think like even though we're all working from home, we don't really need to have our presence there. We have our system to provide us like visibility on the performance of the riders deployed. Um, every single detail of the delivery will be there that we can actually assess if the rider deploy this reliable or if it's not really working at all that we need to replace so everything like the platform that we created it's enough for us to understand um, the effectiveness of the service that we're actually running using our fleet system so and with all the technologies available like um, the internet connection uh, the online uh, platforms for like conferencing and training everything works for us right now all right. Uh, now I'd like to actually welcome all of the speakers back to, uh, to the to the webinar. Right. Uh, I want all of them actually to come here. As for the last part of our webinar, is more of a panel discussion, a po uh, open discussion for all the people who are part of this webinar to ask questions that you want to ask them. Uh, I'll just start things off by asking. Actually, this is a question for all of you. Uh, given that you guys are all business owners, you all manage your own startups and your own businesses, uh, I actually want to ask, during the lockdown, uh, what are the top things that you guys are prioritizing? Is it more on cash flow, getting new clients? Is it more on downsizing, sad to say? Or is it more on product development? Maybe you can give us more of an insight on how are you guys dealing with your startup during the lockdown. Uh, maybe Dennis can go first. You. Yeah, so what are we prioritizing? My gosh. Uh, well, I will say that uh, first I have to thank our entire team. You know, we have uh, a growing number of uh, over 30 staff, primarily uh, here in Manila, here in uh, Alabang. But uh, we also have some staff in, um, in some other countries. But... Uh, I, I'm thanking them. Obviously, I owe them a lot of thanks all the time, but <laughs> but uh, it's because we are just working double and triple overtime on almost everything, um, to be honest with you. So uh, we did everything that uh, Judy had suggested and because uh, I think it's a smart, prudent uh, business leader thing to do is to have diligence and look at all of your financials. Uh, and so there's no reason or no excuse not to, especially in this time and age. And um, so we looked at all those and uh, we acted on things pretty quick. Uh, but at the same time, um, we started our, actually we started accelerating our growth plan because I think for everybody, 2020 was gonna be very, very good. Uh, but we found it more important, like Pete, uh, Procter & Gamble, to accelerate. So um, we had to have our product development team, instead of making some of our features and products later in the year, we move them up, right? So that we can help address more needs of our consumers. We also um, focused on the retention side. So we implemented more online how-to guides, literally instructional guides, you know, we're creating handwritten guides we're creating more videos because people need to understand on their own time at their own convenience 
how to use technology, right? So that's what we're doing on the customer support side. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud at least to share some success to uh, those out there. I mean, you know, we're, we're still even hiring. So, um, you know, if you or anybody else out there in the community knows some, you know, really good solid people that uh, want to help enable companies through their digital transformation, um, you know, we're, we're happy to get introduced. But we're trying to do everything and everything we can to empower uh, SMEs here in the Philippines because now is when they, they really need it most. And even if that means making these sacrifices of time and investing more now, you know, it's just something we have to do. We never even thought about not doing it. <laughs> it was just like, oh my God, we got to do this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dennis. I mean, I guess now we know that Dennis is more focusing on awareness and helping the other startup and SMEs here in the Philippines. Uh, how about for you, Judy and Jeff? Mm -hmm. Well, first, uh, yeah, we have to check the current cash flow so that I we can see that what we can do, uh, strategies, strategies that we can do, enable to save the current uh, people. So yeah, for, uh, I, I focused on expanding collaborations, partnerships, so that I won't sacrifice the current manpower that I have. And by the time that we're the operations, it's uh, okay already. Uh, then they have something to do. Yeah. Okay, so it's really managing the cash flows. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually wanted to follow up question with that. Uh, regarding while we were talking about automation and how to uh, prioritize everything, mm -hmm. uh, how do you actually, what do you think should be automated in terms of uh, the lockdown right now? What should you prioritize in automating? So mm -hmm. these things won't be redundant for your employees so that you can, they can focus on something else. Mm -hmm. Well, we're actually doing it now. We're working on that with uh, our partner, Monster Lab. They're doing the robotics processing automation. So, for example, the unnecessary uh, repetitive things, the daily works that can be automated. So, that's something that we're working on now. So, that by, by the time that we uh, get back in operations, you know, we have implemented this uh, um, automation already. In mostly in administrative, that's what we do. So right now, you really are trying to automate everything that's kind of redundant and kind of administrative. That's the thing that yes. we're focusing mm -hmm. on. So that yeah, our staff, our people can focus on giving value on that uh, services that we provide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about for you, Jeff? Is there anything that you guys are prioritizing during the lockdown? So for the product de development and for, for, for product de development for last mile is pretty much uh, business as usual. So we're constantly like pushing the product, adding more features in, adding more services in, or features so we can actually enable more services um, to be offered to our customer. Uh, but currently the, the the focus is to actually to provide a better or a strong, strong customer experience and a support team so it's mostly like our it's it's always been our goal since the start to actually provide the customers that we approach um, an excellent service or expe the expectation that they're they wanted to have from us so um uh that's the current priority is to have a good relationship and provide like the whole uh, um the business model or the 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 service being offered to their to our customers so everything is business as usual for logistics, I would say, with few restrictions. But yeah, um, currently the focus of Last Mile is actually providing um, the best services for our customers. Okay, uh, I just have a few more questions before I open up the floor. I see there's actually a lot of people already in the chat asking questions. Uh, but I just have one more question for each of the panelists. Uh, again, for, for Dennis, uh, my question for you actually is, uh, what do you think should, or amidst for this lockdown, is it still, do you think it's still viable or do you think people or businesses should still promote their products, their services 
uh, online via Facebook or Google ads or anything like that? Do you think startups and businesses should still continue promoting what they're doing? Yeah, that's a great question. And as um, sometimes how simple it can be, it, it, it does have a lot of companies and professionals. It has them, it makes people pause right now. Um, primarily because, and that's not a bad thing, right? It's because it's all about being human and uh, being mindful. So um, yeah, I, I would say that yes, it's an important that you continue to make yourself um, aware, make your customers aware that you are still there and that you're active. Um, I think you should package it, um, you know, uh, so that you acknowledge the, the, uh, the pandemic and you thoughtfully build a connection between the pandemic, your relationship, you know, how your services can help and really, it, at the worst case scenario, you're not selling anything. You're always, uh, I hope, educating and building confidence and connection uh, with your customers out there. Uh, you, I, again, let me say that again. Um, especially, it's okay to absolutely promote your products and services, but through education. Right, and helping and teaching people how to get through the crisis, uh, just like we're doing today. Um, everybody's products and services can be helpful because today we're all looking for the things that we used to have that we currently don't have, right? Uh, so yeah, it, it is important. Um, but if you don't recognize a situation and you just sell your product and service, then you become the lower priority. And this just happened to me the other day. I won't name any names and not to scare any real estate professionals off out there because, you know, I'm always looking for a great time to buy, especially in the bottom of the market. And I'm sure that I'm not the only one, but uh, someone sent to me a message <clears throat> and the message was basically, <clears throat> it started off with why you have nothing to worry about in real estate. That's a little naive. I mean, I just personally, if you ask me, that's a little naive <laughs> to say there's nothing to worry about right? <laughs> um, when it's clear and obvious. And I, I asked the person, I, I gave them a little uh, benefit of the doubt. You know, yeah. can you give me your opinion in a little bit more detail on why you believe? Because maybe he's got some insights. I'm looking for insights. I'm looking for, you know, professionals that know more that are really, you know, um, astute and knowledgeable about their area, whatever that is, whether real estate, accounting, logistics. Um, somebody sent to me a, a vegan food kit. I'm like, yeah, I always love to get educated about new ways to get these things, you know? Um, but I was, I responded and I was like, so what do you mean? Are you, you know, uh, I, I didn't call them out. I, I really wanted to know because it was kind of shocking. <laughs> So yeah, there's just a right way and probably not a wrong way to do it. So yeah, hopefully that helps. But absolutely, you should be out there without a doubt. People wanna know and people really actually still feel good and um, it adds a little bit of resilience to the world these days um, just to show that everything is still moving. So it's really more focusing on the messaging, more of like how I can help you, how we can work together uh, in helping your business or you as, uh, you in general. Absolutely. With or without the uh, crisis, that's our, our big mantra. Right? Okay. Uh, so I guess for those people who are trying to actually still promote their products, I guess it's really more of the messaging, uh, really mm -hmm. more on how you can help others in, in this time of crisis, right? Uh, Judy, you were talking a while ago more of automation uh, and things to automate. Uh, I just wanted to have a follow-up question with that regarding on how easy is it to actually automate administ administrative tasks for you guys? Well, actually in our business because it's doing uh, the back office. So we have a lot of repetitive uh, tasks that first you have to document it so that we know where can we see uh, what to automate? No? So 
for example, it's something uh, that really uh, no brainer thing to you know. It's it, it's just really repeat and the task is just uh, a daily thing that uh, repeats every day and uh, something that um, yeah you can already uh, consider you know, as one of the things that you know robots can already the automation can do it. People can just add. Uh, and analyze on that later on. So that's how you can uh, see where you can automate things. For example, uh, if you're doing uh, an email or a message that you know every day it takes you two hours, but you're actually saying the same thing to people, um, that's, I think that's something that you can, you know, even the um, frequently asked questions. So you have to check if you know in a day you've been asked about this question for uh, twice strikes or more than then something that uh, you can consider to automate already. Mm -hmm. Wait, real quick. Uh, I, have a, I have a question for my uh, two um, awesome fellow panelists. Um, and sorry to put you guys on the spot, but they are a little bit uh, <laughs> you know, serious, legal, and governmental, if you will. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Judy's like, uh-oh. Um, so we'll start with Judy since she's got the mic real quick. Judy, um, give all of us SMEs and professionals uh, a little update. I, you know, luckily, you know, we have professionals like you that that help. But what what's the state of the union? Do we still have to pay taxes and all that stuff, or what do you suggest with how to handle taxes right now? <laughs> Well, for now, um, they're saying that they're just deferring it, but I think we're, uh, the business community is uh, doing a movement that if we can yeah, have those tax uh, amenity, uh, uh, amnesties and uh, yeah, still in process because, uh, well, we have to balance because if, you know, the government can also get taxes from us, uh, from the taxpayers, then they also you know, uh, be limited of where they can get money for the government budget. No, so, no offense, and not to start some political turmoil, but I do have an honest <laughs> question, right? Like, mm -hmm. how did our government run out of money so fast? Uh, well... <laughs> <laughs> okay, you don't have to answer that. Honestly, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this um, movement that we're doing with the private sectors, we're trying to make solutions together, trying to thrive and uh, survive by, or in, with our own means, putting it all together. I think uh, that's what best we can really hold on for now than just to wait and really be hopeful for what the government can give us. Yeah, good, good, good emphasis on that mm -hmm. point. Let's not wait for those. <laughs> Yeah. All right, my other kind of legal slash government slash question is for uh, for Jeff. Mm -hmm. Jeff, what's the latest update on what can or can't be delivered as of right now in getting through across city lines? You know, right. what are you hearing from the from your channels? Actually, then, that's really, 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 really tough. I know. <laughs> There's no clear mandate on such, um, and there's no de clear definition of the essential products and what can be moved here and there. Um, what I understand from my from more experience with the team, we've been having like problems here and there, um, uh, miscommunication between LGUs. LGUs sometimes impose something outside what the IATF actually declares. Um, like um, even the rider has their IATF passes. If they don't have the rapid pass stickers, you cannot go through. So if like if some some LGUs allows deliveries as long as those are necessities like food, uh, groceries, vegetables, and all. So it varies day to day. And then uh, what we normally do, we adjust. And we have another way to actually go about it because we have partners with. All the documents so if we need their help we actually enable them and support businesses to operate still so that's the beauty of like having our platform with different um, uh, logistics so providers involved in one platform we can actually create a solution even though we have a problem right on the spot 
So if one city doesn't allow us to go in, we have another partner who can help them go into that area and do where the people are still fulfilled. So um, yeah, on the legal side, there's no clear um, definition of such. Um, there's still a lot of like loopholes on uh, what can be moved or not, but pretty much like as long as your items is close to essentials, essential product, um, you have a bigger chance of actually delivering it to your customers, and you'll have bigger chance if we can actually help you with that. So we'll have, we'll match you to like, for example, you have one city that we believe will be tough for you to move your item to. We will suggest like maybe for the city make use of this instead rather than like um, having your own. So those are like the, the insights and the idea that we can actually share to this assistant. The music's are like help and services. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I wanted to have a super last follow-up question with that. Uh, Jeff, in terms of for the startups or the business owners here currently in the webinar, uh, and they want to avail of your product or your platform, how fast is it is the turnaround for them to actually incorporate your platform for their startups or businesses? Like for last weekend, someone actually approached me 6 p.m. Okay. at night. 8 a.m. they have a rider and they have a delivery service operating right away. So we can be as quick as needed, if needed. So I'll I'll be awake with you to plan step by step until like two in the morning, if needed. <laughs> okay. We had an experience like, so just... like three in the morning, and we start operating by seven. So like good luck to us if we can still wake up. But yeah, we need, I'm a morning person, so that's not a problem. So like, and onboarding can be very quick, very very quick. Um, depending on what the business need, but we, I would need to have my confidence that you you know what to expect when you go live. So I want to. I'm a project manager myself too. So I want to make sure the expectation is there. If I don't see like the customer understand what he's going into, um, I normally suggest like let's push it a day or two, another day, so you you'll be clear what to expect on the whole deployment process. So yep, we can be as quick as like right. even today. Today, you can do it today. Okay, uh, for those anyone who wants to avail of that, uh, again, just feel free to contact Jeff. Uh, now I'm opening actually the questions to our audience. So if you have any questions, please feel free again, just pay, put it in the chat. Or if you want, please raise your hand so you can unmute yourself and you can uh, ask your questions to all our speakers. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> all right, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, go ahead. All right, thanks. Um, guys, the three of you, thank you very much. This has been very enlightening, and I wish that there had been more people uh, listening. But uh, my, my question is, um, is to Jeff. Um, yeah, Jeff, kudos to um, fulfilling that need there in a very efficient and, and um, effective way. But my concern is, from a, from a consumer standpoint, um, especially delivering or receiving deliveries, when it, um, especially when it comes to consumables such as food. Um, so, because first principle approach here, we're trying to spread, uh, we're, we're preventing this, the spread of microbes or what you might call it that you're, you're handling, right? Um, th there are some people who are very like OCD or like the, the germophobes. Um, if they ask for, for food deliveries, for example, um, is is there like a protocol from from the writers or or do you think that um, there should be some standard handling of of food, especially the ready to eat because uh, you don't have to cook it. Especially, well, it, there's there's no problem when it comes to cooking something, but when it comes to delivery, like um, I understand microbes usually they thrive in in moist um, in environments or surfaces, but um, for me, for example, the last thing that I want is to go to an emergency room, and and I yeah. think that emergency rooms don't 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 admit me unless I have an ARDS um, uh, syndrome. So uh, principles of triage there, I'll, I'll just be put aside. Um, so not just with not just with um, with coronavirus there, but just general sanitation practice. Um, how do we address those? Because all of us are consumers anyways, and we sometimes order food. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that this will be a, a long-term um, concern that needs to be addressed. Um, if there's nothing uh, that is 
currently being implemented, what would you say would be the best um, uh, habits of these riders, especially handling consumables such as food, so that they can at least minimize the spread or whatever it is on the surface? Okay, so um, thank you very much for that. Actually, that's very timely to the situation. So off the bat, what we normally do before we actually deploy the riders there, on the service deployment, we actually state all the required um, things that the riders should have, like face mask, um, uh, alcohol, gloves. Um, give it in the proper place. They take a photo and store it in the split delivery management system, so everything will be documented. That they didn't have like a direct contact to the customer. So a lot of our customer now is practicing no contact, so um, they wish to do payments through online. So. That's very tedious and manual, so most of the time they make use of GCash, PayPal, or any bank platform. So um, that's the current model for them. And yeah, um, we have what we must have prepared also for the riders in Tagalog and in English. So uh, prior to their deployment, there will be a manual on how to make use of the delivery management system or um, uh, that's actually a, um, and um, the protocols of the search. We have like a branded um, a PDF file that we share on deployment on how to make use of the system and, and what are the expectations during the deployment. So I'm a German for myself, so I'm very really careful with, with, with like uh, with uh, the COVID situations. So I want to make sure that you know the quality of the service that we have is right right on the spot. So yeah. That's how we do it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Like training and making sure our partners are the ones we really know and they're capable to make such special services or um, requests on deliveries. So basically, the same kind of like in our building, there's a food handling training company. So even at the delivery level, there's probably going to be also some enhanced food handling. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, requirements and specifications, it sounds like. That's good probably for a lot of, you know, companies and consumers to know, yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, there's actually one more question here uh, from the audience. They were asking, uh, can I further ask through, uh, ask though regarding Facebook page versus websites? I agree with you that marketplace is like a cheap and inappropriate gar garage for a professional business. But how about a Facebook page? For years, I'm quite in doubt on the standing of website with the rest of Facebook pages and even apps of companies. Uh, I think this is more of the difference between uh, what's the difference or main pros and cons with having your own Facebook page with regards to a marketplace, regards to a website, or even regards with a Viber group. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Probably a whole other webinar in itself. But um, uh, I, I'm curious, what uh, you know, as um, startup founders, business owners, Judy and Jeff, do you have a, an opinion or a way or a method in which how you guys use your Facebook page? And then I um, can maybe round it up. Yes, an e-commerce seller. If I may share my my insights on that, like uh, me as an e-commerce seller. Um, <laughs> Uh, platforms, right? Uh, the marketplace wherein you're sharing the space and you have the same products in one page and all you need to do is to be competitive by giving like the best, lowest price and there is mm -hmm. delivery options to your customers so you can do like same day um, if, the, if one of the mer if one of the sellers selling it for 50 pesos, you need to sell it for 49 pesos so they can just mm -hmm. say to you um, the problem with that is um, there's no loyalty or customer retention, like if I'm a seller, rather than having your own website. So if you have your own website, um, your customer, like you can actually enable repeat customer or your customer won't have like so many options. Maybe someone else will be selling it for 48 pesos and you lose them. Um, and they thought of like your products is similar to them. But what you're offering is better than that 48 test. So um, for customer retention, I would say website, your own website will be the best way to do it. And it's really easy now to build one. Um, 
for you if you want to add more income in uh, marketplace will be the second option to, to generate more sales mm-hmm. towards your platform and that's mm-hmm. my perspective yeah well I, i agree to that that website is more reputable but uh most of the people since we need to also have a To, to be in the e-commerce platforms like that marketplace but the ratings you should build on the ratings um, how um, reliable you are so I guess that one you should uh, take care of when you're in the marketplace whatever e-commerce platforms and then you will lead them to the website where it's more uh, you know you can uh, it's they can see that it's uh, You have already have established really your products and services. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's great to hear from uh, how others are using it. There's, um, those are all accurate, good answers and approaches. Um, to add to that, we believe that there's an actual science to how you use both Facebook and your website. So first, I would say is you need both then you break down what parts of Facebook do you need. So I would suggest, and there's, here's the recipe, right? Obviously you need your personal Facebook page. Um, if I were you, I would also create a Facebook community page, and then you need a Facebook business page. All three of them, and you could read and learn this straight from Facebook's help center. All three of them have three different purposes. And when you understand the different purposes of them, then you'll know how they, they work for your business. And then you'll know how it works with Facebook and your website, right? So a couple quick examples, right? So your Facebook business page, number one, brings authority. And um, consumers today heavily rely on trust. And that's where, as Judy mentioned, your reviews go, right? Uh, That's also where your story, um, a list of your products and services, and that's where the connection to your website goes. That's often the place also that people go to possibly either not just promote or give you a good review, but that's where they could possibly go to give you a bad review. So you need to be there also. And there are tools for you to integrate your Facebook chat with your website chat so that then they become uh, synchronized and working together. Your community is where you build that ongoing trust and the followers and viewers so that every time you promote content or your business or your products and services, you automatically get in front of them. And then you use your personal to actually outreach and connect to people. After you outreach and connect with them, hopefully through education, not being a salesperson, then you have quality content that leads them to your community, that leads them to your Facebook business page, or that leads them to your professional website. So they really all work together as a science and an art. Great question. All right, so it's really more on having actually all of them together possibly <laughs> and targeting the right people with the right uh, channel. So it's really more on how you can uh, use each of the different channels the right way so you can optimize and get more customer feedback, get more customer acquisition from all those different channels. Okay, uh, is there any other final questions before we end this webinar? Uh, I know we've exceeded about two hours already the target time. Mm. Uh, I hope everyone's still okay. Thank you for everyone who's actually stayed with us throughout the whole webinar. Mm. Uh, again, last call for any last questions that you want to ask before we end the, the session. Uh, okay, uh, there's one more question. I'll go. Uh, Jam, uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Real quick. Uh, this is for Dennis. Um, so, <laughs> so, So we need to strategize that we should not be salesy, right? We should not like ask for business. You, you put in a bad light there. Um, so we should be more on educating and informing customers, making more wise decisions and probably coming from a from a uh, abundance mindset instead of a uh, scarcity mindset there. So what would you say is the rule of thumb, Dennis, would be the percentage of 
um, educating them and then asking for the sale. Like what's that sweet spot? And then to, just to follow up the question, when you distribute your, your content, um, what would you say is is the best and most pragmatic way? Is it by by uh, composition of, of an art of a blog or or photos like infographics or or video or voice? Those two. Uh, what percentage uh, ratio? Um, market uh, education and, and sales. And then what when it distributing them in what form? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We follow a and try to create a framework for our customers and we give this advice all the time. So that's a good question. And, and that framework uh, in formula is, is just this is it's a three and one. So I believe that human nature is kind of set up that if you give and help somebody um, with useful, insightful information three times, then um, again, there's no magic number, but that's just a, a good standard. Then, then you have earned some right to ask for some kind of next step or some kind of request to have a call. Um, but it's those, anything less than three, I guess that's another way to look at it. Anything less than three, you just shouting salesperson, I want to sell you something. I want to, you know, I'm only operating on my self interest. And that's probably the biggest no-no. And that just scares the fish regardless. Yeah, three, three and one. So you probably feel the same way. Like if I was at, you know, to go after you and find you on Facebook, um, right after we connect and as soon as we connect, all of a sudden I'm like, can we meet, can we meet, can we meet? Right? <laughs> that probably comes across kind of creepy. Uh, the other question, and I, I, um, I'm not sure, if there, I'm sure there's probably some other advice and probably some good funny stories out there. The other question was... Whether a photo or uh, writing an article, exhaustive or, oh. or video or voice or just like some, some candid, uh, you know, real, like day in the life of uh, say a realtor or, or an accountant. Yeah. I think that it depends on your industry and your target audience. And as you can see, the good news is, uh, well, if it was for me, I would do basically all of them, right? Because uh, I think one of the last couple slides I showed, it's, it's um, clear that everybody is not just online. There's 50 plus percent more people online than ever. And people spend more in diff online and their time online in different places just like they do a physical brick and mortar mall, right? You might go to one mall and you kind of stay at this wing because those are that's where all of your areas of interest are. So there are some social media channels and places online that are better suited for, um, you know, younger people like TikTok and Kumu, right? Uh, there's other places that uh, are more suited uh, or they have a bigger following for females right um and then yeah so by knowing your audience and knowing that more people are online that would i think really help you but uh, i would try to find and, and use as many channels as you can because why not they're there so thank you all right yeah. uh, actually there's one here uh if you guys the speakers you guys can actually give your insights on this uh from manzon she she's asking that since everyone mentions about creating a new website you can also can you as well share a good platform to create one uh -oh. <laughs> so besides from <laughs> so if you have any suggestions well as for me i think we can also just uh dennis dennis's startup you actually if you guys can call back in I think he can help you with creating your own website, but like for you guys individually, do you guys have any uh, suggestion or tools on which you should try to use? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, um, uh, I think uh, we better check on... You won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me just say this before you go. We're, we're, mm -hmm. I think we're working already with Servio. Yeah, so we... Joey's Garagas group, so yeah, for the website. I'll go ahead and say it so that nobody feels yeah. bad. The reality <laughs> is that there's a lot of choices, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're not all created the same. 
and they all have a different target audience, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll actually, I, I tell clients, maybe we're not for you, right? If it was me assessing today, here's the way I would look at it, right? If I had very, very little skills and very, very little money, I would, as I mentioned before, I would go to Google Sites, right? All you need to pay for is your domain. If you have a little bit of money and you have a little bit of skills, just a little bit, you know, there's things like uh, Wix, Squarespace, and Prosperna. If you have a little bit more money and a little bit more technical skill, you could still have the same choices, Wix, Squarespace, Prosperna, then WordPress, right? If you have more money and you have the skills, but you don't want to waste the time, <laughs> right? Then you look at all of those and then find a reliable service provider to do it for you, right? That's my easiest, most unbiased, way of saying it uh, and then now you guys can say whatever you want <laughs> <laughs> well said Dennis <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it depends on what you need definitely like um, you really need to qualify uh, what you need there are platforms that are industry focused right so pretty much like um, for CMS you need to look at their templates if that works then that's perfect um, uh, the services, the features, or you need to qualify those, and also the team, the support. So, um, yeah. having having um, an international platform might be tough for the support unless you pay for a premium. Um, those are the things that you need to know, especially like when you're starting off a website. So, um, an option also to have it custom developed, but um, depending on your commitment on like, or like how important is the website for you and how customized you want it. So, um, depending on you need, you need to assess and then maybe you can talk to an expert like Dennis. I'm sure Dennis would actually help you out with that, like give you assessment. <laughs> He'll be very honest. Like, have you seen like he told us like what are the options that you have? So he'll be honest. Like, um, Prospender can do that. Prospender cannot do that. There's a better option. What's your budget? Like, best is to talk to experts. So mostly like dev companies who has experience on building websites, platforms for customers. So yeah, depending on what you need, that's what I suggest. You need to know what you need before you actually yep. do something. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, let's wrap up the session. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dennis, Judy, and Jeff for for joining today and actually sharing your insights on on today's new normal. Uh, again, I just wanted to say that like, for all of you out there, uh, where everyone's here to support and help you with your business, we're all out here. If you just want, just connect with us. We're here to help you in any way that we can. Uh, and just to summarize everything that we've learned uh, again today, there's always going to be winners and losers throughout this crisis. And it's really up to you guys and how you guys are going to adapt uh, your business throughout the crisis and how you're going to uh, address this, the needs of the customers that you guys have. Uh, with that being said, don't forget if you guys need like online platforms for delivering, Jeff is here. If you need a place to help you produce your websites, Dennis can help you guys out. Uh, if you need services in terms of helping you with your accounting with your cash flows managing those judy is also here to help you guys out with that uh let's keep in mind that we want to make sure that all of us survive throughout this crisis and make sure that we bounce back after the covid lockdown so again with that uh thank you everyone again for joining today's session uh i know we've extended for more than two hours uh, and thank you again for everyone staying for the whole day uh, feel free to reach out mm -hmm. to any of us uh, and we'll be happy to, to connect with, uh, with all of you. Again, thank you everyone for having us today. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. Congratulations, yeah. Jeff and Judy. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you also, Carlo. <laughs> thank you. Carlo, thank you. man. Thank you. The rest. thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day, guys. Thank you. Thank you. This is a good, like online good network day for you, session. Carlo. 
after the kind of talk with like our own drinks on hand. <laughs> Yeah. Next time we should have our own beers online. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, you guys want to stay for a little bit? We can do, uh, you know, post event happy hour. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, we'll, Dennis I mean, will sponsor the beers. Jeff will bring the beers to you for your doorsteps. Sneaker <laughs> bag. <laughs> You hey, thanks to all the community members of SMEs out there. Please be safe. Please be happy. Please be healthy. And um, let's get on the winning side of this. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great Bye. day. Thank you.